Hi there, and welcome to How To with Ann Malum. When deciding to do this podcast, I really wanted to create something that could give people real tools on how to execute on certain things. So often we talk about things on such a macro scale that yes, leaves people inspired, but with no real idea on what the steps are to make something in their own life happen. I challenge and encourage and probe my amazing guests to get granular and specific on their strategies, their mindset, their tactics, and their methodology so that you can learn practical, actionable steps to best optimize your competence, career, health, and wealth. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the How To Podcast with Ann Malum. Today, we are thrilled to have Jeff Lerner with us today, and Jeff's how-to is how to unlock your potential. Let me tell you a little bit about Jeff, you guys, because he has an amazing story. In November 2008, during the Great Recession, Jeff found himself at rock bottom. A former professional piano player, Jeff found himself nursing an injured wrist, evicted from his apartment, getting divorced by his wife, struggling with depression, and owing creditors about half a million dollars from a failed restaurant venture. Fast forward to now, and Jeff is a five-time Inc. 5000 CEO with over $100 million in sales, to his name, who was happily remarried with four beautiful children and living the life of his dreams. In 2019, a decade after turning his own life around, he founded Entra, Entra Institute, the world's first institute of higher learning for entrepreneurs, which is now one of the fastest growing education technology companies in the world. He currently splits his time between running Entra Institute and appearing in the media, inspiring others with his remarkable turnaround story. Jeff, I love all of this, and I can't wait to dive in deeper with you. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ann. So glad to be here, and I uh, appreciate the kind words. Well, let's just start. I mean, there's so much to dive into here, and I already have a zillion questions, but if you could just give our listeners a little bit of background in your own words about your story and who you are and what, your help, what you would like to help people leave this podcast with, this podcast with today, that would be great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd happily do so. Um, you know, you gave, I think, a decent uh, biographical background there. So I, I want to try to kind of fill in between those lines. Um, obviously, I, you know, my life is somewhat defined archetypally as like this, you know, this rags to riches turnaround story, right? I was yeah. a, I, I, I had inauspicious uh, early phase. I dropped out of high school to become a musician. I was always getting in trouble in school. I never really fit in. I never really saw myself having a place in, you know, all it mainstream establishment society, getting, you know, getting a job, climbing the ladder, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Even though, frankly, that's what my parents had done. I had like successful, you know, upper middle class professional parents and that, that path was there for me, but it just- Well, I was just going to ask that. I was like, where did all the rebellion, rebelliousness come from? Like what was the upbringing? It sounds like it was pretty stable. I don't know. I was an only child and both of my parents worked. So maybe I just had too much time alone. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, idle hands, that whole thing. But yeah, I didn't know. I, I think honestly, I'm in intrinsically an artist, a creative, and I just never saw myself being happy in a life where I wasn't consistently creating and outputting and really self-expressing through work. I think a lot of it derived, and I, and I suspect there's people in your audience that will relate to this, a lot of my need to be creative and productive derived from an inability to find my place socially and through through naturally through connection. You know, I, I grew up with a genetic disorder that I think was probably a bigger deal to me than it was to anybody else. I had this sense of being different and almost being defective. Yeah. And frankly, I think a lot of people would not have even known what I was talking about. It was more, more something I carried. Um, and I just didn't really feel like I connected to people, but I found... Uh, I guess in middle school, I discovered that with music, it was kind of a way to be felt without having to be known, if that makes sense. Like people could feel me. I could get that that emotional reciprocity of connection to people, mm-hmm. but it wasn't me. It was the music. I started playing guitar in middle school. Yeah. I would sing songs and, and suddenly like it was like, oh my gosh, people like me or, or right. at least they like the way, the way I sound right now. Right. And so I think I just sort of ended up substituting music and creativity for like actual actually developing the self-esteem to to really connect with people in a vulnerable, you know, knowable way. And that's me, so I, you know, lots of therapy later. I've psychoanalyzed yeah. myself to death. But I, I think you, you know, project that in my 20s, I was I dropped out of high school because I didn't see the point of that path, became a musician, 
played, you know, put it in my 10,000 I just want to pause you there because that is, that is so brave, right? Well, you're talking about high school when you're what, 16, 17 years old, Mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, as a kid and you and I have a little bit of a shared story and just like, I'm, I always sort of knew I was supposed to do something special and different. Like I always just felt it. I didn't know what it was, but there's no way I would have had the guts as a 16 or 17 year old to get off a, a, a path in front of me of, okay, this is what I see to success. What what on earth do you think caused you to be so brave at that age to completely, at a, yeah, yeah, like. So when I was between my sophomore and junior year is is when it all, it all either went, I broke but good or I broke bad, depending on your perspective. Um, so kindergarten through sophomore year, I went to a, a, the same school. I was So I was with the same group of students for 11 years from five to 16, which is different from most people who, you know, kind of reset their social environment when they go from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school. So I had the same just sort of like social hierarchy, like re- reinforcement of my peck- place in the pecking order for 11 years. Like I, I got picked last at sports and I, and I, I became kind of a nerd at five. And at 16, really nothing had changed. And so that was, and so then my, I went on this summer backpacking trip where it was the first time literally in, in, you know, my life where I got to reset. I got, I got a do over. I got a mulligan on creating myself socially and interpersonally because it was all these new, just new people to, to connect with. And they were all kind of spits too, because the kind of kids that get sent on long summer, arduous summer backpacking trips usually there's a story there, right? Right. And so we're kind of like this band of misfit and, and it's my first opportunity to actually truly be known and and my creativity was valued and my idiosyncrasies were actually interesting because I fit in for not fitting in with that group. And I basically actually liked, by the end of that summer, I actually liked myself. It was yeah. amazing. I was like, okay, there's a version of me that can, that really feels authentic and doesn't have to feel alone. And so when I came back, I just no longer had any, there was just no part of me that was going to go back to that school and that environment and that scene. And in that, and and with it, with making that break socially, I just, I, my whole life, this alternative possibility for my life where I was just so much happier and more fulfilled presented itself. And there just was no way I was going back. And I had to have that conversation with my parents. Like, I mean, it was tough because my parents we're both high achieving professional people. My mom was a partner at a big law firm. My dad was a successful, you know, money manager and institutional investor. And I had to like literally say to them, guys, I know that you have worked your whole life to create this path for me. I'm your only child. So it's all on me. And I'm about to completely dash your vision for my life because I, I can't do this. Yeah. And I need to, well, I need to, I need to be an artist. Yeah. Well, one, the awareness for you didn't have that conversation and not be rebellious and, and understand how your parents might feel of you deciding to drop out of high school, which again, most people drop out of high school and we all have the stereotypes in our heads of, okay, drugs on the streets, you know, all right, of this right. sort of thing. And that really wasn't what you were thinking. But, you know, uh, at the end of my podcast, I usually ask a question, which I will ask you around, you know, pain, success, all this stuff. But so it sounds like, Jeff, once you felt a sense of belonging, which I am convinced of Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? It's right, right above food and shelter. We are looking for a sense of belonging. Yeah. Once you got a taste of that and the pain you felt when you didn't belong, it was like, I don't, this isn't even a debate for me. Like I'm, I'm not putting myself back in an environment where I don't feel accepted or, or belonging for what reason there's no benefit. I totally agree. And I think there's a little bit more context too, that's important, which is I actually grew up with us with financial security like i never i never worried about you know the power getting shut off growing up right like a lot of these stories and i think that actually and yet i was so miserable so much of the time i decoupled at a fairly early early age money from joy and i think a lot of people that grow up without money or without even just basic security they have they, they will start to idealize what life will be like when they have enough and i just never was prey to that that uh, delusion that that having enough really had anything to do with our psychological well-being. And so I I just developed a, an early sense, like my currency was spiritual and psychological freedom. It really wasn't money. Right. Because money wasn't doing it. And we weren't like, we didn't like own a private island, but we were just comfortable. But that right. meant nothing because I was still so uncomfortable. Right. So I think that's an important bit of context. 
So and on that piece of context, let's pause right there and talk about some actionable items for folks who might be feeling that same way you felt when you were 16, 17 years old. If if you aren't feeling a sense of belonging, um, and again, I've been right where you are, Jeff, too, when I was 26, 27 years old at, or 25, 26, and just feeling so miserable of never wanting to do the things that everybody else in my peer group wanted to do. I didn't want to go out and get drunk and drink. I'm like, I'm looking for a purpose. I'm looking for fulfillment. I don't know where to find it. Someone please tell me. And I was just so driven by my misery of like, I have to figure this out. I can't, this can't, this can't be it. Like I can't continue my life like this. So I'm curious on your advice for somebody who is feeling that they don't fit in or belong or the path that they're leading is just like unfulfilled to them, unfulfilling to them. So I talk about uh, in my book and, and I've really, I mean, I, I will say there's a, a much denser unpacking of this than I can, I could do here on your show. Um, but when I look at, so I organize life into three, three basic categories. I call them the three P's, physical, personal, and professional. And really that can encompass the totality of your life. And, and frankly, I use it as a lens to look through to say at any given moment, am I advancing myself physically, personally, or professionally? And if I can't figure out which one I'm sort of working on at the time, uh, it's, I'm probably wasting my time doing something trivial. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, and that could, that, that's a pretty broad you know, sure. uh, opportunity set, like, like, I mean, personal investing in personal relationships, creating memories, like even sleep is physical well-being. I mean, there's, you know, any, sure. just don't do dumb, useless, productive stuff basically is the, the summary of that. But anyways, and then I, I organize each of those groupings. I break them apart into like, my, my goal was to create an operating system for myself. And there's a long narrative of how I got here, but I wanted to automate success and make it a predictable given by creating an, uh, an operating system for my life because I knew I was taking the road less traveled and I knew that nobody was ever gonna give me a playbook on how to be successful on this path. I need, so I, so I went to work figuring out an operating system that would make self uh, successful, you know, practical success of having enough money to be comfortable couple and, and raise a family and provide basic security for loved ones, coupled with creativity, productivity, self-expression and a sense of fulfillment and to create a system that would ultimately lead there without having to rely on willpower because I, I found myself like all humans to be fallible when it, when it comes mm -hmm. down to just me muscling through. And so within the professional, I, I'm, I'm sort of drilling in quickly, zooming in, but within the professional area, I identified three value channels along that I call them value channels. These are the three areas of my life that I have to be developing in the professional success category. One, only one is financial. The second is authority slash reputation slash influence, kind of like my esteem and my respect and my footprint in the world. And then the third is actually creativity. And so I have done a lot of, you know, there was a phase where I did a lot of coaching. I worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. I worked with a lot of financially successful people, people that basically had two out of, the, two out of those three boxes checked. They had the finances, they had the respect or the influence or the authority or the esteem, if you will, and they were still unhappy. And, and I, and I, and I would help them identify, what are you creating? What indelible fingerprint are you living in this world? Are you just running other people's plays and reading other people's scripts and your life has become this program programmed routine that leads you to all the, the, the superficial trappings of success. And, and it's even good for your ego, but you're not actually creating anything. We're fundamentally creative beings. I mean, we were created and we were, and we create each other through Steps. I mean, we create. That's like how we got here. Yeah. And if you're not creating, you're dying inside. I believe it. And so that's what I would, you know, to your question of, of what about that person who maybe is not feeling fulfilled? Ask yourself, what am I creating? What's going to outlive me about what I'm doing other than my kids? It's that's as, as wonderful as kids are. They're not enough for most people. Yeah. And, and, I, and I appreciate you saying that. And I think that's really true. And I love what you said about the operating system of your own life. And there's a lot of people that go out there, they go to work, they're told what to do at work, and then they come home and they feel like, oh my God, I'm finally in a place where I'm not told what to do. And they spend a lot of the time being counterproductive, right? Whether it's watching TV, consuming social media, just sort of, you know, I think there needs to be a, from, for, I think it's really good to check in and ask yourself the percentage of your day that you're spent consuming and not producing, learning, you know, whatever those things are. And it's exactly right. If you don't have a plan, for how your day is supposed to go in those certain areas that are important to you, 
And what's important to you doesn't have to be important to me. But if I'm going to say my physical health is super important to me, my financial health is super important to me, you know, being able to be playful, creative, whatever those things are, it's up to me and me alone to make sure that I have a system in place that allows me to fulfill those areas that make me happy. I mean, to to your point from before, you know, I I recently sold my company and and there are people who are like, oh my God, how great you never have to work again. And I'm like, what? Like that is the furthest thing from my mind. The reason I sold my company is so that I could make more space to create things that don't exist anymore. And now I'm like, ooh, what else can I get up to? Because that company had gotten to a point where it was so on autopilot and assembly line and I really wasn't needed anymore because those aren't my skill sets. And it was like, I need to close that chapter so that I can open up space for all these new things for me to like be a part of things that aren't in existence yet. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I will say, I mean, those, those new beginnings. So 2018, I sold my previous business and it basically like pseudo retired for about three weeks at 39 years old and was like, yeah, this doesn't work for me. But, but it, it, I never really had the sense like, oh, I'm just going to play golf. I don't, I don't golf. It was more like, okay, I'm going to take a little, a little beat here and figure out what's next. And I thought maybe that, that would last a year. And it literally only lasted a couple of weeks before I, right. I, I had my, my next blue ocean idea which is what I'm doing now. And it's, yeah, I mean, I've, I literally probably put in more hours now for, for passion than I ever did for money. Right. But, but I, I'm, I'm fulfilled every second of every day. Like it's, uh, it's not, I mean, the word work has a lot of baggage in our culture. Yeah, totally. If, if you think of it more as like being creative and productive all the time, like it's yeah. amazing. Who wouldn't want to live that way? Well, and people associate work with, with getting paid. And I'm like, I just came back from the gym from an hour session. Like that was work. You know, when right. people say, oh, it must be nice. I'm like, you go do it. The reason why people don't do it is because it's work. And, you know, people justify they have other responsibilities and things that they're that they're doing to get away from some of that hard work, even though you're not getting, quote unquote, paid for it. But everything you get paid for it doesn't have to be in, you know, financial or monetary currency. I'm getting paid in my health. So I will introduce, I mean, I know this is a how-to podcast, right? Like yep. we, want, we want practical ta- takeaways. So I'm going to introduce... Probably the concept that changed the trajectory of my life more than anything, and that not coincidentally, I, I learned about it. Uh, at, I, I heard the term at 29 years old, which was right. If you plot my, the course of my life, that was right when my 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 decline turned into an ascendancy. I mean, financially, physically, professionally, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, like everything got worse in my 20s and better in my 30s. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the concept I learned right at the end of my 20s. Most people live under the tyranny of the urgent. Mm -hmm. A thing they feel like they have to get done is literally the great dictator in most people's lives. And if you can train yourself, discipline yourself, condition yourself to extend the time horizon through which you view your life and yourself and, and sort of incorporate the future into the present, then it changes everything, right? It just changes everything. And so to your point, like, do you, you said, well, I'm, I didn't get paid to go to the gym, but are we really sure we don't get paid for going to the gym? Because going to the gym as a consistent practice definitely extends our span of workable time over the course of a life. Mm-hmm. And we all know from the law of compounding that your last 10 years are probably a lot more valuable than your next 10 years. If you're making consistent deposits in your life accounts. And so that practice of going to the gym right now, absolutely. Even if it doesn't pay you now, it gives you a lot more time in which you'll get paid and earn interest and earn dividends. And I believe there's a direct ROI on decisions we make now to extend our workable life and take better care of ourselves. People just don't see it because they're only looking through the lens of the present because they're ruled by the tyranny of the urge. Yeah. So how does someone change that mindset? And I, I, someone when I was really young or in my 20s also did that to me of just like, we cannot, there's lots to do and exactly that. Like the tyranny of the urgency is what will is what will destroy us. And like, we have to think vision in long term. So I totally get what you're saying. Can you give some examples of what you maybe were doing at that time that switched for you when you, when you, when you applied that way of thinking and how you spent your time? Uh, yeah, I, I think I got pretty relentless about saying no to things. Mm. You know, I think that's an exercise I've done with people where I say, make a list of everything in your life you're currently saying yes to. Make a list of everything in your life you're currently saying no to. 
And usually people are just saying yes to be more things than they can ma- they can be masterful at. I mean, there's only 168 hours in a week. And, you know, depending on your, your biochemistry, you got to sleep anywhere from probably 42 to 56 of them. And that doesn't leave that much time. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I live a life now that is almost ascetic by certain standards. I have a really tightly scripted routine, but it now work a lot of hours. And, and again, I'm like, I consider going to the gym part of my work. I consider personal development part of my work. I consider reading books part of my work. Like I'm working on me and I'm, I'm sharpening the saw when I'm not actually chopping down the trees. Right. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing I, about my life is I've already made 99% of all the decisions that I'm going to need to make over the course of my life. I made when I set up my schedule. Mm-hmm. So I just run plays all day. I don't have to decide things. Yeah. And, and that's because I've already decided what I'm saying yes to, what I'm saying no to. I've already taken the time to, to make sure that all the things I'm choosing to say yes to, A, they fit my, my larger plan. And structurally, I can organize them through time blocking into a workable, livable life and schedule. And then I just basically, like I already, I I could pull up my calendar and show you almost every single thing I'm going to do for the next two weeks or 30 days. And there's a lot of, a lot of the next year is already planned. And so that's what I would say to people is, is get really, you know, take Occam's razor to your life, distill it down to its essentials, say yes to as few really important things as possible and automate and pre-script as much of your time as possible, reduce decision fatigue, reduce distraction, reduce all the context switching that chews up, you know, life is about marginal economics, right? So, so this was another, uh, concept that really, really profoundly changed my view of life. And, and it was actually explained to me in terms of the price of oil. So this is kind of interesting. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't know what, oh, you know, what the, the global oil production is set out right now. Let's say it's 90 million barrels of oil a day, right? And that means that globally we're consuming or we're utilizing pretty close to 90 million barrels of oil a day, right? Now the price of oil, for the price of oil to, to double, they don't have to cut production from 90 to 45. They don't have to cut it by 50% to create a doubling. They've probably only got to cut it by 2%. Like if they cut production from 90 million barrels to 88 million barrels, that small 2% decrease could result in a 50% jump in the price because Mm -hmm. it creates an imbalance in supply and demand. That's called marginal economics, right? The volatility is at the margins of production. That's our life. So we might think, oh, I'm already putting in 50 50 hours a week. Okay, if you can figure out how to create two more hours, you could potentially double the advantage that you have compounding over time. Mm -hmm. And so saying no to a few more things, reducing a little bit of context switching, eking out an extra 30 minutes or 60 minutes of productive focus every day because you optimize your life could literally result in having 10 times more money when it's time to retire. Right. Yeah. It's, so. the, law, it's the law of doubling, right? Whether it's going from $1 to $2, $2 to 4 and then you have a million, million to 2 million. I mean, and when you don't look at life that, that way and you don't have the patience to look at life that way, You know, I do think there's a little bit of scatteredness and, you know, okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. But it really is patience around consistency. And I think, Jeff, finding a vision for your life and to your point, if anything doesn't fit into that vision and your vision doesn't need to be my vision or Jeff's vision, you just have to get really clear on what buckets of those lives, where things are today and then where you want things to be. And one of the questions I ask people when they feel stuck or they start to think that their life's going to look different, you know, just with time. And I'm like, well, if you're going to play that game, then you should go backwards. You know, how is your life look different today than it did five years ago? Did You know, when you five years ago and you say, oh, just, you know, when I'm 30, things are going to be different. And if they're not, it's not just time will wash over you. Like it'll literally wash over you and take years of your life if you don't get in front of it and play offense. So getting consistent on if you want to be in the best shape of your life when you're whatever, that means you got to go to the gym five days a week and like make that decision. And every successful person I talk to brings up decision fatigue. And so when you're when you're deciding what to do every day, to your point, whether it's willpower, and that happens to me if I miss my gym session in the morning and then my day starts going and I'm like, oh, I can go to the gym now. And then I'm like, okay, what if I go now? And then it becomes literally brain space and a conversation and debate in my head 
that probably took up an hour of negotiation that didn't need to be there, that I could have been doing thinking about other things. Yeah. And what lesson have you taught yourself about keeping your commitments? Right. You've actually, you've not only wasted time and drained energy, you've eroded your own confidence and self-esteem. Yeah, it, it, truly. And it's just like, I have found too, when I put my head on my pillow at night, when I sort of, you know, assess my day and when I feel greater, like, why don't I feel so great about this day? It usually is when I have wavered from the consistent things that I know are right for me that I said that I would do that I didn't get to. And if I know that I did those things, and that I showed up and played at a really high quality in the areas that are important to me, that's when I go to bed really quickly. That's when I fall asleep really quickly. So you get that positive feedback loop. And I think it's really important to emotionally pay attention to that of your own personal positive feedback loop of how you're spending your time and your energy and working toward the things that you say are important to you. And I talk a lot too about the justification equation. I used to drink pretty regularly, not heavily, but regularly. You know, I'd have a cocktail, a, a tequila soda at the end of most nights, and I didn't want to let that go. So I justified it. Oh my God, like I'm I'm so successful. Like I do all this stuff for charity. I, I provide for people. I work out. Like what is the big deal? Like, you know, I'm not going to be perfect. And like deep down knowing this wasn't serving me, but I would create a narrative that other people would buy into so that I didn't have to let go of this habit. And I think a lot of people do that all the time. And that really gets in the way of, you know, living your life in this optimized way and, and achieving the goals that you say that you want to achieve. Yeah, I, I totally hear you. And, and there have been, yeah, like the, those little justifiable, you know, call them vices, call them indulgences. I, I, you know, again, that's why I like the physical, personal, professional lens of like, is this advancing my, me physically, personally, or professionally, right? And and that would have been one of those things that probably would have failed that check for you. Yes. Um, and we all have them. And I think there's two two thing, two concepts uh, that I'll introduce, and these are both, you know, part of my operating system. I mean, the general question of how to unlock your potential, you know, the name of this episode, right, is is really about creating an intentional and pretty detailed operating system for your life that preordains success. That that would be the, the broad takeaway. Mm -hmm. But with, and so I've done that. I mean, I, I, I will say I am successful because I have done that. And to the extent that I have done that and whatever success I have in the future is entirely based on how well optimized my operating system is and how committed and consistent I am about living it out. Um, but the, the so there's two concepts I'll, I'll sort of place around this part of the conversation. One is part of my operating system and, and it's, it kind of a nice play on words is I will not go to sleep at night until I have taken my nap and nap stands for nightly assessment and planning. Okay. And that's simple, a simple look back to the day that just passed and look forward to the day ahead. I believe that success every day starts the night before. So every night I have a basic set of boxes that I look to check, you know, and it's, did I make my physical, personal, professional deposits for the day? Did I live my morning routine? And did I execute the plan that I had determined the night before? And so it's it's kind of a check-in on the scheduling and the automation of like, hey, have I pre-scripted my life with enough detail and enough thoughtfulness? Every night I check in to make sure that the next day is already clear. And I call it taking my nap. So that's one one concept uh, cool. you, you know, that I would introduce. The other is just environ I, I we call it environmental engineering or environmental restructuring. You know, I, I would ask you in your life, when you were having that nightly cocktail, what what in your environment was reinforcing the okayness of that choice? I'll bet, you know, was that something a lot of your friends did or a lot of, you had a lot of people around you that said, hey, take it easy on yourself. You deserve a, a drink at the end of a hard day. And you were having that environmentally reinforced, whereas- And I was looking for that environment. I was what? looking for the environment to reinforce it. Oh yeah, we naturally, yeah, exactly. We put, whereas if you went and hung out with a bunch of extreme endurance athletes training in Moab, Utah, yeah, they would have been like, um, sorry, we don't even allow alcohol into our camp because we have right. a bigger goal, a bigger game we're playing. It's just, you know, and then over time that would have become normal for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I, I, the relationship I'm in now, you know, when I quit drinking last spring and really became vocal about it. And I'm like, I've been duped like everybody else who has been told that alcohol is innocuous and it's just a part of life and it makes life more enjoyable, less stressful. 
and it has a part in every little area of your life. No kidding. Whether it's a rainy day, a Friday, uh, a stressful day, a good day, like it's just everywhere. And I bought into that. And as soon as, you know, I started talking about it and saying, I'm a, I'm a wellness expert. People look to me and like, I, I, I'm like, I've been hypocritical and I need to call myself out. And then once I stopped drinking, you know, the law of attraction, right? I, I attracted uh, a partner who also doesn't drink and it's not a part of any part of our fun together. And it's the most playful, fun relationship I've ever been in. And alcohol doesn't have a place where before it's like, oh, you're going to have more fun if you're having a couple of cocktails to loosen up. So it was changing that mindset. I want to I want to dig in a little deep because I know these people and I'm sure you do too. And frankly, you know, I've had employees like this where whether I've had to let them go, they're doing the work, Jeff. They're up working 10 to 12 hours a day. They're working harder than anybody else. They're just working on the wrong things. And when I've had to have conversations with folks who are in positions around you're not working on the right things. You're not having any output that's actually having impact in the right way for the business. So these people who desperately, you know, feel like they're there and they're like eager and they're willing to work, but they don't know where to make the deposits. So how do you help somebody who you can see? It's it's like, I'll give you another example. It's like when I see women at the gym on the elliptical machine for 90 minutes and I'm like, oh, I want to go talk to that woman about lifting weights because I know she's going to get a lot more bang for her buck if she just spent and she educated herself a little bit more on physical fitness and like understanding, you know, how the whole realm works, but she's probably has the mindset of lifting weights is going to make her big and bulky. So what do you do with individuals? Because I think that's a lot of people listening where they're like, man, I'm a hard worker. I work a lot, but they're not seeing any movement happen in any real way. Yeah. I mean, working, working, what? Working on who would be my question. Like you're doing the work for 14 hours a day, you know, it, it's, and the seventh habit in Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly successful people is increasing your production capacity or what, what they call sharpening the saw. If you're not familiar with the analogy, uh, I think Abraham Lincoln, at least he's who gets credit said, if I had five hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first four hours sharpening my saw. Right. right. And so I would ask that person, you know, I mean, and, and, and it's, some of it is, is task or, or career specific, right. But like, what are the fundamental skills and attributes that determine a, a stellar achiever in this, whatever, in this role, is it communication ability? Is it, uh, building, is it networking and having a great Rolodex of contacts? Is it, um, time management? Is it usually it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be more about skills than it is about effort. And so how much of that time are you actually spending working on the skills? Now I run an, an entrepreneurial education platform where we have a lot of people that are transitioning or trying to transition from trading time for money, mm -hmm. where they have a basic doable set of tasks that they know they can do. They got hired because of their ability to do those tasks. And then as long as they just show up and do those tasks, they get basic sustenance in return at, at, to some you know degree. And usually everybody's calibrated their lifestyle to where whatever they get paid does little more than help them survive at whatever life, lifestyle uh, they've set for themselves, right? And so, so now they come into an environment of entrepreneurship where like we say like, well, I don't care how hard you worked. Entrepreneurship is about exchange of value with the marketplace. No customer is going to give you money because you, you're you like, well, I worked 40 hours this week. And they're like, yeah, but this, this burger is overcooked. I asked for medium rare and this is like a, a hockey puck. Yeah. You know, I want my money back. And you know, I put in my 40 hours, man. I cooked that burger for you. It doesn't matter. It's all about the value delivered to the marketplace and the perception of the marketplace and how, you know, the, the mar in entrepreneurship, the market is the great democratic value calculator of the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not getting the return for that and jobs to some degree lull us into a sense of there being like a baseline value exchange that happens just because we showed up. Mm-hmm. That none, I mean, you know, you know, as well as I do in entrepreneurship, nobody cares that you showed up and I, I mean, yeah. we have a saying, nobody cares, work harder. Right. But even that is, is misleading because it's, nobody cares, work on yourself harder to make what you do more valuable until people start to care and take note and be willing to pay for it. And so totally. I would ask that person, like how much like the, and it's it, usually the answer is layers deeper than people want to go. It might be like, Hey, why do, why do people, why did you not get that promotion? 
Maybe it's just because of how it feels when you walk in the room. And maybe that little thing that is sort of indescribable and indefinable, but that people talk about when you're not in the room, because that's your brand is what people say when you're not in the room. And they're like, yeah, we didn't, we didn't promote him or her because I don't know, there's just something about them that doesn't, I don't, you know, I'm not sure that I don't see them as the future of that role or what it's like, they don't even know how to describe it. And you got, you got to own it. It's yeah. not their fault that they feel that way around you. You have to go, why does, why do people feel that with me? Maybe it's because of some unresolved issues from my divorce. Maybe I carry around a little bit of anger that I haven't fully processed out yeah. because I got so mistreated when such and such happened. And maybe I need to go do 2000 hours of group therapy, or maybe I need to go volunteer to work with, you know, adopted animals, or maybe I need to go work at a soup kitchen every weekend for the next four years, or maybe, you know, whatever, maybe I need to take up transcendental meditation, but, but whatever, you got to do it, or you got to make peace with the reality of your life for not having done it, but wanting, not wanting to do the work, but still wanting to have the result is if you had. When the, when, when the work is scary because it's on yourself, that's yeah. the tragic hypocrisy that most people live until the day they die when it transmutes into regret and then it's too late. Yeah, I, let, I love that. I think that that way of thinking and that mindset is we can't, we can't walk into any place. And I'll give you an example of people I've had to, you know, to let go on whatever. When you don't, when you blame everybody else, the only person who loses there is yourself. It might feel good in the moment and like, oh, I can't believe X. I'm telling you, if you're a high performing individual, your company's not letting you go. If you're doing a job that is articulate, wow, this person is producing three to five times their, their salary, more than likely they're not letting you go. And it's really easy if our ego is you know, letting ourselves lead here to blame other circumstances, blame the company, they're unfair, they're mean, they're X. And it's the same with any kind of victim mentality. You can play the victim card all damn day and you're probably getting some attention for it. But the only person losing at the end of it is you. So until you empower yourself in any which way and take the feedback that you're getting, you know, that's the only time you're going to grow and get what you want. When you're resistant to, to constantly hearing from people of you're not performing at the right level or or whatever. Um, yeah, I see that. I see that a lot too. And I see a lot of people equate passion and effort with, I shouldn't be fired or I should get what I want. And, and to your point in the real world, and it sounds tough, but it's true. Nobody cares. Like, it's great that you have passion for what you're doing, but if you can't show an output, and again, I'm going to go back to that's in all areas of our life, Jeff, we're, you, we're going to people, the most frustrating point is just that when you're working so much and you're not seeing output right it's the old adage of the the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and not seeing anything different we have to change the way that we do thing and i was just saying this this morning that you know there's a lot on instagram or platforms and social media where people are on and they see people take an ice bath and sauna and i do some of those things too and i'm just like guys I'll tell you what, taking ice baths and, and having sauna sessions is not going to make you successful. You know what is? Educate yourself. Understand how things work and how outputs and how the world works. Those things are not not important, but I think that there's a little bit of this movement going on now that it's just like ice baths and saunas are going to make you a millionaire. And I'm like, it's that's it's not true. Like, it's not how, how it works. No, it's it's not. But the, the thing I like about those things, which we would generally term hormetic stress, right? It's sort of self-endued micro doses of intense stress mm -hmm. that drives, you know, adaptive response is like, you do have to somewhat change your relationship with comfort and discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and I think that's, that's the value of those things. But if you do them, if the, the point isn't to do them and endure them and be miserable the whole time you're doing them. Mm -hmm. The point is to find the joy, find the experience, find the the timelessness, and I think train your mind to go to the long term over this over the here and now. That's it's really about the developing the discipline of not being ruled by the tyranny of the urgent. Because right. when you're in an ice bath, the urgency is to get out. Get out. Right? right. But you you train yourself to think in this this long form way. But here's the thing I think in society, there is a great lie 
you know, I feel like the the dark forces of the universe or whatever you know label you want to put on it, in every in every culture they work in different ways. It works in different ways. In this culture, it ooh, it works through comfort. That's totally how it works. Whatever again, label whatever the force in in the world is that wants you to not thrive, not succeed, not be happy, not become your best self. Works. I promise. In this world, it works through comfort, and it's in the language. We see clues all around us. If again, you said get educated, learn what words mean. You used a few words. Passion. What does the word passion mean? Where does it actually come from? It's the Latin root is passio, which is to suffer. Hmm. If you got fired for your passion, congratulations. That yeah. it, that was appropriate to the meaning of the word itself. You're probably going to need to suffer even more to actually prove to the universe that your passion is real and it's not just how you feel in the moment. You use yeah. the word care, like if you care enough. What's the root of the word care? It's a German word, karen, which means grief or sorrow. You don't actually know that you care about something until it's causing you grief or sorrow. Think about caring for a child. Yeah, it's not meant to be hunky dory all the time. Uh, you use the, the word commitment comes from Latin, con mitere, to send up with commitment. Underneath the word commitment is actually means the word sacrifice. What did I give up along with the thing that I committed to? People say they're committed. I say literally within the meaning of the word, if you can't tell me what you sacrificed the moment you committed, you're not actually committed in sense of what the word means. But society now has whitewashed what all these words mean where you're not supposed to have to go through any pain anymore. Mm -hmm. That's why people do ice baths now. It's to remind us sort of existentially and spiritually that it's, we actually have to go through pain because it changes our orientation. It's the reason that there was a spiritual practice of fasting, but now it, now it's become about the vain superficial result of fasting rather than the psychological discipline and the emotional orientation that it teaches us. And, you know, in a world where everybody's trying to be comfortable, it's no surprise that nobody seems to be terribly happy. Yeah. And it's the it's the comforts or the word, you know, I'm offended. I'm this, I'm that. It's, it's like if anything disrupts us or that we don't like, we have created a society that, around entitlement that we're allowed to, you know, that person needs to change or this needs to change instead of us becoming comfortable with the idea that there are discomforts out there and there are different opinions out there and there are different ways to view something and live a life. But, you know, instead it's like, I'm offended. You need to change. I'm offended. You need to you know, whatever. And it's, it's a lot of people are soft, you know, around that category. And I don't think that anybody that's, a, that's to me, again, the victim role. And there's a difference in, you know, one of my favorite Brene Brown quotes is that shaming is not a social justice tool. And we continue to, you know, shame or blame people for things that we're offended by and act like that's going to, you know, change their mind. And when there's an acceptance of that person thinks differently than I do, and it's not their job to, you know, not say or do something that I'm not going to be offended by and whether that happens in work or everything else. But yeah, that's an interesting take on things of maybe why sauna and ice bath is so hot right now and cold, I guess, is because of just that. Like we are looking to be reminded of a little bit of, you know, the discomfort and how motivating that actually is. And when we can work through something that is so uncomfortable of how rewarding it actually is. Yeah, I, I think as human beings, we we actually do deeply long for like like pain isn't suffering. Pain is suffering that doesn't mean anything. It's when it's meaningless. What you know, we think about the sacrifices we make for our children. I mean, most parents will tell you that being a parent is one of the most rewarding things in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's it's virtually all sacrifice. It's virtually all a giving up of a possibility because of another. And yet it's so fulfilling and rewarding. I, I just think deep, and we don't need to spend too much time on this point, but I just think as human beings, we actually long for suffering that has some sort of transcendental meaning and is, isn't just sort of like abstract and, and asinine. And, and you know, the because the, again, unhappiness doesn't come from, from discomfort. It comes from, you know, that, that moment. If you think about your least happy moment, it's the moment when there was no point. Well, let me ask you this, Jeff. I mean, on that point, when you talk about people making real change, do you know, true or false, that uh, immense pain or suffering needs to be a part of any substantial or substantive change in someone's life? Yeah. So I've interviewed, you know, I have a podcast called Unlock Your Potential. Forgive the shameless plug. Mm -hmm. But uh, the I started that podcast as a research project. So it seems somewhat similar to this, where it's like, I'm going to find 
really high performance people, uh, outlier achievers in different areas. A lot of them are entrepreneurs, but it's also artists, also athletes. And, and I'm just, and I'm going to try to get to the core of what made them different, what them unique, what made them, you know, one of Malcolm Gladwell outliers. And then if I, you know, you look at any one great achiever and it's easy to make them seem very different from yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you look at hundreds, if you do essentially a meta observation of high achievers, and you start to realize all the commonalities, they start to get more and more like yourself where it wasn't a function of them being different. Fundamentally, it was simply a function of them either having different beliefs, making different choices, or in, and luck is when opportunity meets preparation. So let's say they, they made different preparations mm -hmm. or to get lucky, right? And so from doing that, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't present myself as some sort of like grand truth sayer but I will say I've done about 250 episodes and I haven't found any, you know, elite high achieving person that I've talked to where I've gotten really into the depths of their story that hasn't gone through great suffering, great hardship, great, you, you know, I would call it their crucible in which they were all, all the attributes that ultimately made them so successful were forged. And I would say to somebody that's struggling, struggling with more of like pointlessness or lack of fulfillment. It's not about how can you feel better. It's probably about how can you make yourself feel, not feel worse, but, but do whatever you have to do to feel more meaningful, which usually involves feeling worse for a time. Yeah. Yeah. We can all reflect on our own stories. And I think it's really interesting for anybody listening, you know, whatever, we don't really make changes when we feel kind of this low level vibration of frustration, right? We kind of just deal with it. And there are people, you know, in 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 my life of, of most recent that, you know, got diagnosed with diabetes and trying to talk with these folks for years. And it's really hard to do that when their family, you know, of just like, ah, uh, you know, eating right, exercising, whatever. It took a crisis, right? It took being told you have diabetes and now the exercise is happening. And now those things are happening, right? Because before it's like, well, I, I'm fine. I'm not sick. So I can keep doing, you know, this one thing. And most people need some sort of crisis um, to have that sort of change. I mean, I, we didn't get into much of that story of, of bankruptcy, whatever. But Jeff, when you got to that point, you're like, I don't have a choice. And I guess I felt that way of starting my, my business way back in the day when I took all of my money that I had saved and at a young age and put it all in. I'm like, this has to work. I don't have a plan B. And you put yourself in a position where it's like, I will figure this out because I don't have any other choice. And that can be a really motivating sense. So to the point about unlocking your potential, again, true or false, feel free to debate with me here. But part of it is getting out of your comfortable sense. Put yourself in, a, in an area of discomfort where you're going to be tested and learn a little bit about yourself and understand maybe some of the choices that you're making that you're keeping yourself in comfort aren't actually serving you. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah, you know, I'll say, I'll say true with a lowercase T. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'd, I'd have to elevate spiritually to start declaring absolute truth for all, all the time. But certainly, yes, I, I think that, you know, you can look at your life. I mean, if I said, Hey, meet me at the gym tomorrow at three 30 in the morning, you know, for some people, they will literally tell you there's no way I can do that. And other people, they're like, Oh, okay. If that's what, if that's a puzzle piece that I need to put in place to create the picture of my life, then sure. I'll see you there. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like the person who says there's no way I can do that is physiologically that different from the person who doesn't even hesitate to make commitment. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about their relationship. Even again, that term commitment of sacrifice, the person who doesn't hesitate to make the commitment knows it's going to be hard. They've already given up the thing, which is sleeping in. And, and, but that's their relationship with commitment. That's their right. relationship with sacrifice. That's their relationship with comfort. The person who says, there's no way I can do it. Now you might like, if somebody said, Hey, meet me at the gym at three 30, I would say, well, I've, al I've already optimized and organized my life such that actually I'm not going to be at the gym at three 30 because I get up at four and I do my, you know, my certain prep for the day. I have my routine and actually my gym time starts at four 45, but I'll see you there. Like that's, I would, I would totally respect that person because their, mm -hmm. their answer has nothing to do with their relationship to comfort or sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it has everything to do with the, their, you know, their intentionality and their command and control in their life, which, I mean, that's another way to look at your life is to what extent am I the driver and to what extent am I the passenger? Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I, my goal of my life is to just drive as much as possible on the road that leads to where I want to go. And yeah. I don't, you know, I, I do a lot of, I, you know, now I don't do as much one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I oversee this ecosystem with thousands of bull transforming their lives and, and in real time updating on the process through our community group. So I'm hearing feedback from people that are going through the crucible themselves in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's always about. It's about renegotiating the relationships to time, renegotiating the relationships to other people, uh, you know, and the, and their environment in general, renegotiating the relationships to, to their feelings and their emotions. Yeah. And, you know, that's just, that's harder work than, you know, I don't know, like you said, sitting in a sauna for 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, and I like the, I like the nap idea too, because I think some of this, Jeff, and you, you've probably gotten to a point, and I think I have as well, from years of practice of saying yes to a lot of things. And I'm like, I shouldn't have said yes to that. That didn't benefit. And like, now I know. So some of this, you guys, is like, yes, listening and taking it in. But until you go through it and, you know, not just going through it and how you're spending your time and who you're spending your time with, but it's taking the assessment afterward and saying, what was what was the value in that hour that I just spent and was it worth it? Because you do get really good at understanding and assessing. I'm like, I don't need to be a part of that meeting. There's no reason for me to be a, like, right. I'm not going to add any value or the value that I would add, you know, would just be nominal. And I'm not sitting in that meeting unless it's a million dollar plus decision. So you you learn to step into that agency, but it happens through through practice. So I think, I mean, the most important thing that I think people are going to take from this podcast there's a lot here, but like it's the assessment piece and really being honest. What's the vision? Where are, you, where are you unhappy in your life, whether it's your finances, your health, your career, your relationship, your relationship with your whatever those things are. And you have to start looking how you're spending your so time and grading it to how that is actually benefiting these pillars that you say that are important to you that are contributing to your happiness. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it is, you know, we have what are called cognitive biases, right? They're distortions and they're, they're, they're objective distortions in how we view ourselves and the world around us. And I'll give you a very quick example. One of these biases is that we tend to overestimate the present and underestimate the impact of the present on the future and the price that we'll ultimately pay, right? So it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? And the future is in sight for most people. That's why I'm, I'm always obsessing about extending my time horizon through which I view the present. If if you can change our view of the present, it's sort of like the, you know, uh, what's the, in the Bible they say, uh, to, to telestai, right? It is already done. It is finished. I was like Jesus' last words on the cross. It is finished. The entirety of existence in that moment, to hear him, hear him say it, it's already done. Well, okay, I'm not trying to get religious here, but at least look at our life and say, it's already done. And when we do that, then these ripple effects these compounds, either assets or liabilities that happen based on little things in the present become, they sort of weigh on you. And I'll give you a really quick example. So my wife and I host a boot camp. Last week, it's called the Three Piece Boot Camp. And for three and a half days, we just work closely with a handful of people and, in, and, and just really drill into these Three Ps life optimization, life operating system process. And so we got a message on Saturday, I guess, uh, this past weekend, when somebody from our boot camp, our recent boot camp, had just gone back to their, 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 their call it their real life, right? And they said they got there and they, they were updating us in our, in our WhatsApp group. And they said, hey, my family, you know, they were like, so how was your, you know, become a better person seminar or whatever? And they like something kind of dismissed it, right? Yeah. And they said, and now bear in mind, at the boot camp, we work a lot on communication, effective communication, executive communication, thoughtful communication, emotionally validating communication. There's all these different angles we approach communication. And and the the lady updating, she was like, in that moment, I thought back to what I had been practicing for the last three days. And I said, thanks for asking. It, it, I'm paraphrasing, but she basically said, thank you for asking. It felt wonderful to be there and it feels wonderful to be home, but I'm kind of tired of traveling. I think I'm going to go to bed. And they, she said, it was so different from the way I would have engaged to their sarcasm prior to the boot camp. And she was started doing the, and I, this is like when I lit up like a proud parent, she started doing the calculation of what did I save by approaching it that way. I saved an hour knockdown, drag out, energy draining, time wasting, emote, you know, wedge driving 
fight with my family. I saved, I, I gained a better night's sleep. I saved reduced performance the next day because I was tired, because I got drained and I stayed up later than I wanted. She's like, it, it you know, it's hard to quantify, but I might've gained $10,000 in benefit because I learned to have that, that five minute conversation a different way. And when you start looking at your life that way and actually putting that much weight on the choices and the behaviors in every moment, now you're set up for success. It, it, success becomes inevitable, but it, it, it's a mental discipline. Like to your point, it's not just a, you know, working another hour or working a little harder, burning a few more calories. Yeah, that, that was a really great example because, uh, you know, it's really easy to talk about these things when our emotions aren't high. But when you get in that high emotion situation and you want to defend yourself, and you want to whatever, and you're like, for, for for what benefit? You know, that's real emotional uh, maturity exuded on that the, person's behalf. And to the sharpening the saw point, she right. spent three, she, she paid money, flew to another state, spent a week practicing these things, came home, implemented it in five minutes. Yeah. And received immediate benefit. But like most people wouldn't have, I mean, our boot camp only holds 15 people. And and frankly, we, we announce it to thousands and right. only a few come through because most right. people don't want to make those investments. Right. Anyway, I know we're, I know we're about out of time, but I, I know, I'm, I'm going to end, end on that and then ask you, you know, where people can find you. But guys, you, again, you talk about investments and time and all the things that we spend money and energy on and the consuming piece. Get yourself to a program like this. You know, when you think about expending four to five days on something, I've gone to Tony Robbins, you know, I've gone to both two Tony Robbins events and like, you know, the worst case scenario, you leave and you're like, I didn't buy any of that. Okay, it's fine. So that's the worst case. scenario. best case scenario, you get the tools, the learning, the understanding where you, you go make big changes in your life. It's such a small price to pay. I always tell people like one of the biggest, best investments you can make, of course, is in education, personal development and surrounding yourself with people who have what you have. And so, you know, do you, wh where can people find you, Jeff? And are your programs more exclusive? Do you have, if someone just says, I want to get more into, you know, Jeff's world and learn from him, can people listening do that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share that. So um, if somebody wants to kind of like try out, you know, varying size bites of my world, me, that's a weird way to say it, but my world and my, my philosophies and my, my ideas. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that's got over a thousand videos. Some of them are 45 seconds. Some of them are 45 minutes where I've unpacked these philosophies uh, along, you know, seemingly every imaginable angle. Um, so that's a, a kind of a good try before you buy a place. If somebody's, so I've got a few different places they can go. If somebody's like, hey, I want to embrace this entrepreneurial way of being in the world. I'm ready to get control and and and, I, and I'll say my my platform Entra is basically built on what I consider to be the fundamental defect of most personal development. Mm -hmm. It is that it doesn't it doesn't also give people professional options. So at Entra, you come do all the personal development, but you also learn skills to 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 create new career opportunities for you to start your own business, create online side hustles, get more time freedom, get more 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 leverage in your life, right? So it's an entrepreneurial education platform. It's really got personal development wrapped all around it, as you can kind of tell when you hear me yeah. talk about. And I believe entrepreneurship is where the personal and professional growth converge. That's why I, I love sharing it and teaching it. So, you you know, you can go to my Instagram or go to any platform of mine and there'll be a link to go check out Entra. We have like very inexpensive courses, $39 course you can start with. We have a free ebook you can download. Um, and then I mentioned my boot camp. I mean, my wife and I do a few of these a year where if you want to come out and spend more time. I mean, I would say just go to YouTube or, or click a link for Entra and, and we have something for, I mean, we literally have, that's, that was one of my endeavors here is we, we wanted to have something for everyone. Even at Entra, if somebody says, I don't have a single dollar to my name to, to invest in education, we actually have a, bo a program called Bootstrap where we'll teach you basic skills to start earning with. And we actually will do scholarship matching for every dollar you earn through your own efforts, implementing what we teach for free. Mm. to match you to able to be able to buy our courses so anybody okay. can do this this is not off limits to anyone and it's just jefflearner.com or where can people uh, oh yeah jefflearnerofficial.com is my website okay. or if you just search Jeff Learner on any social platform okay awesome and Jeff I just want to give you some accolades here of coming on this podcast and being of of service it's really the point of this you know everybody knows that like my team vets anybody that comes on here so we don't need to talk so much about your credentials that's already been done and you just did an excellent job of taking your story, what you've learned and providing all of these wonderful nuggets for people, which is what this podcast is all about for people to learn. So thanks for showing up in that manner. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me. 
Yeah. Awesome. 